At this point, the uh, Sky Crane is looking out onto the terrain and trying to find the safest place for our rover to land, making sure it doesn't, you know, hit any rocky areas or ledges. And when it finds a suitable position, the Sky Crane lowers the rover on the tethers, touching down safely, at which point it cuts the tethers and flies off into the distance. So with this, we've arrived safely on Mars. The uh, Perseverance rover has touched down and is ready to begin surface operations. Here in Jezero Crater, uh, where we're going to be looking for signs of ancient life. Pretty, pretty exciting stuff. So this is just a few hours away. And at this point, I think it would be great to turn over to our expert, uh, Joey, and kind of ask some of the questions that you guys have remaining as we prepare for this moment. So Joey, if I could ask you the very first question that uh, is popping up so much in student questions is, Obviously, why Mars? Uh, of all of our solar system, um, you know, why is Mars such a, an interesting destination for us? Yeah, well, first off, I'm really, really happy to be here and to be with you all. Um, and Mars is similar to Earth in a few ways, but different from Earth in ways uh, that are manageable compared to other planets in the solar system. Uh, for example, Mars is only slightly more than half the size of the Earth um, with a diameter of um, the Earth has a diameter of 12,000 or so kilometers, and Mars has a diameter of just above 6,000 kilometers. Um, Mars also has an atmosphere like Earth, uh, but it's 100 times thinner, and the atmospheric makeup of Mars is mostly made of carbon dioxide instead of nitrogen and oxygen, which makes up Earth. And um, the temperature of Mars is also manner, um, which is an average of negative 81 degrees Fahrenheit, um, compared to an average temperature of 57 degrees Fahrenheit here on Earth. Um, for contrast, the average temperature of Venus is about 820 degrees to nearly 900 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is hot enough to melt lead. And so um, Mars is uniquely um, suitable for exploration, and it's why we're so excited today to watch uh, Mars 2020 land. Yeah, it's funny to hear uh, the, the word manageable really does kind of put this <laughs> in context, right? Not exactly hospitable, but at least yes. manageable. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, well, we have a few uh, students submitted questions by video that I'd love to get to. And uh, so if we could see the first one. Hello, I'm a fourth grader. And my question is, what does a rover do once it gets to Mars? Oh, wow. That's a really great question. Um, so what does a rover do when it gets to Mars? Um, you can think of rovers like robotic scientists uh, with carefully made instruments on board to learn about its environment. Um, this includes studying the rocks of Mars, which holds geologic records we can gather a ton of information from, as well as learning about the environments millions and billions of years ago um, through simply studying this rock record. Um, something, a, a term that's coming up around a lot um, when you learn about Mars 2020 are sh uh, stromatolites, um, which are deposits of residue that were left by microbes in the past. And we have some of that here on Earth, um, which were about, which were deposited about 3.7 billion years ago, um, which coincides exactly with a major climate change on Earth, on, on Mars, um, that happened around 3.8 billion years ago. And so we're looking for evidence of are minerals that can only have been created by life. Um, and microbes are also very diverse. There are some microbes that can literally eat metal, um, some microbes that have been proven to survive in unimaginable um, conditions like space or in a vacuum, um, extreme temperatures and more. And there are many talented planetary geologists, astrobiologists and other fields of science um, really interested and are especially interested in Mars 2020 because it's going to um, Jezero Crater, as Brandon has already mentioned, which is next to a delta um, where we think rivers flowed into an ancient lake. And so Mars 2020 is equipped with lasers and zoom cameras, which can resolve images at incredible distances, um, a coring drill with a variety of bits to drill samples and more. And hopefully uh, we will collect these samples in the future, launch them to an ESA spacecraft and bring them back to Earth. So um, there's a lot to do for Mars 2020 when it gets to Mars, and we're all really excited to see it happen. Yeah, awesome. I, I know we have a, a lot of questions on that. We'll definitely uh, speak a little bit more about some of these uh, <laughs> specific. Um, could we see the uh, second student submitted question as well? Hi, my name is Maya, and I'm in the third grade. My question for NASA is, 
How do you come up with the names to name the robots? Oh, great. So how do you come up with names for the rover? Um, I wish I could tell you that there's a secret room um, full of really smart people that come up with it, but actually Mars rovers are named in context by, contests by students just like you. And um, I think that's actually more exciting. <laughs> um, for Mars 2020, a seventh grader named Alex Mather from um, Springfield, Virginia, uh, submitted his winning essay, um, which was selected by NASA from a field of over 28,000 entries from K through 12 students in every state in, in the United States. Uh, Curiosity got its rover from a student named Clara Ma, who at the time was a sixth grader. Um, when she entered her essay, but now um, has graduated with a degree in geophysics um, from Yale University. So um, I definitely recommend sending in essays for when we send another rover or the next mission uh, to Mars and when this opportunity presents itself again, um, because it's really exciting if you do get chosen. That's a, that's a heck of a feather in a cap. Imagine uh, students <laughs> put that on your, on your college applications for sure. Exactly. <laughs> Um, and we actually have one more uh, a video question that I was really excited about, if we could see that one. Okay. Hi, my name is Kenny Wynn. I am a student here at Westchester Academy for International Studies. And my big question is, if or once you find any signs of former life on Mars, um, what are you hoping to be your next big discovery? Okay, so... Um, if we find signs of life on Mars, what will NASA do next? And um, what are you hoping will be the next big discovery? So that is an excellent, excellent question. Um, it reminds me of a talk between Dr. Penny Boston, who is the previous director of NASA's Astrobiology Institute, and Dr. Jim Green, who is um, NASA's chief scientist. Um, and they talked about exactly this scenario. Um, first, NASA would invite scientists all over the world to review the data, and when announcing the discovery, um, they'll allow scientists who are skeptical um, to give their assessment, assessment as well. Um, then, education would be sent out to the public explaining the type of life found, um, which we think will be microbial if found, as explained a little bit before, um, or the size of bacteria or viruses, which are much smaller. Um, and then we would want to return a sample as soon as possible so scientists can use their powerful instruments here on Earth um, to study the samples extremely carefully and with the power of Earth instruments. Um, it would be done usually in a bio level four facility, um, which is where we study anthrax and other really um, uh, uh, important uh, microbes that can cause a lot of damage or we don't know much about. Um, and then the next big discoveries, I believe, uh, will be um, the features and the properties of that life. So what does it use for energy? Um, what's its genetic makeup? Or is it even made of the same genetic material that we are made out of? And so many more questions that I know a ton of really smart scientists and people that have spent their entire life learning about this field um, would love to, to get their hand at trying to answer. And so it's really exciting time. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's almost beyond imagination, right? I mean, to really? think about how <laughs> earth-shattering that, that kind of discovery would be. And I, I think yeah. it's really important that students understand that when we talk about finding life on another planet, just like you mentioned, this is how excited we are at the prospect of even finding microbes. This is, is not Hollywood. We're not talking about <laughs> little green men. Even just the presence of signs of ancient life in itself would be the greatest discovery uh, in all of science to date. Yeah, in that, um, in that same talk between Dr. Penny Boston and um, Dr. Jim Green, they talked about um, what happened when Copernicus uh, found out that um, the Earth orbits the sun and not everything orbiting around the Earth, right? So we found out at that time that the Earth was not the center of the universe, and every single human being over time got that information and had to readjust how they saw themselves in the universe. And I feel the same exact situation will happen if we do end up finding um, evidence of life in the past or current life today. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, we we're, we're, have the potential to live in a, a complete changing paradigm. 